Good noon, everyone. I would like to welcome you guys to this afternoon's presentation. This will be the first, uh, first of the fall semester continuing series of the Created Equal American Civil Rights Struggle. Today's program is in conjunction with the display in the Marvin, Marvin Library. Change in America, I'm not sure if when you guys went in there you saw it, it's a, a big display. It talks about the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and the March on, on, on Washington, 1963. After today's program, please join us uh, in the reception in the lobby area uh, to greet our speaker. Um, on this beautiful afternoon, please take a short walk. Um, we are also gonna have a reception in the, the Marvin Library uh, Learning Commons and view the Change in, change in America display on the first floor in the library. Uh, my name is Mark Riley. I came, from, I came to this uh, community college back in 2012. I'm from a small community in, uh, called Harlem in New York City. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you guys is that uh, one of the things that I did when I first came here, uh, maybe a year later, I kind of stopped out. Not like a dropout, but I, I stopped out. Uh, thankfully, for, from the support and, um, and the leadership from you know, people in the library, which you guys will also find downstairs, one of the gentlemen's name is uh, Roy Pompey. Uh, helped me develop as a young young man, which ultimately led me to be here um, in order to be, be able to, to take advantage of this opportunity and talk to you guys. Also, Hudson Valley is honored to host today's speaker, Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, Jr., from the University of Buffalo. Uh, Dr. Taylor also holds the rank of, of a professor over at that college uh, in the Department of, the, of Urban, Urban and Regional Planning and is the founded, founding director of the, of the Center of, uh, of Urban Studies. Dr. Taylor has, a, has degrees from Tennessee A&I State U University, uh, University of Tennessee, and University of Bu uh, at Buffalo. He is an internationally recognized scholar for his work in distressed urban, urban neighborhoods and social isolation among people of color. He has produced uh, numerous of articles um, in, in scholarly journals and, and, and is an author of several books. Dr. Teller is the re re recipient of numerous awards, including the University, University of Pennsylvania Activist Scholar Award, um, which is also uh, in, in connection with small business program, and the Buffalo District U.S. Small Business Administration Mi Minority Small Business Advocate of the Year. So he's received many awards. Uh, please, please also join us to uh, welcome Dr. Teller to Hudson Valley for his pre presentation, The Four Horsemen of Structural Racism, Income Equality, The Change in Structure of Cities, The Underdevelopment of Black uh, neighbors, Neighborhoods and in, in Individual right, White Racism, and how they relate to Ferguson, Missouri case. So how's everybody today? <laughs> All right. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here with you this afternoon. Uh, this is my first trip uh, to Hudson Valley. And I got here a little bit early so I could get a sense and feel for uh, the campus and its environment. And this is a very, very impressive place that you, you have here. I'm gonna talk for about 35 minutes so that we'll have plenty of time for some questions and some answers. The killing of Michael Brown on August 9th, 2014, spawned dozens of protests and generated the writings of hundreds of blogs, essays, social media postings, and articles. This dramatic response to the killing of a black man in a small St. Louis suburb raises the theoretical question, what is the meaning of Ferguson in this era when ideas about a colorblind post-racial society are rapidly disappearing? Much of the focus on the Ferguson has centered on police brutality and the shooting of Michael Brown by Darren Wilson. I seek to dive deeper 
by examining the structural dynamics and socioeconomic forces that placed Michael Brown and Darren Wilson on the road that led to that deadly encounter. I do this by exploring black neighborhoods, the role of black neighborhoods, as critical components of an American system of social stratification that continually reproduces racial and social class inequality. Specifically, I argue that black communities are durable and crucial sites where race and social class inequality are generated, transmitted, and reproduced from one generation to another. My presentation will be divided into three parts. The first part briefly discusses the structural forces that spawn the black suburbanization movement in Greater St. Louis, while the second part explores the structural dynamics that turn White Ferguson into a struggling, predominantly black suburban community. In the final section, I will offer some concluding remarks. In 1970, about 80% of blacks in metropolitan St. Louis lived in the central city. In 2010, 40% of St. Louis blacks lived in the core. The majority now resided in the suburban community. In the short span of 40 years, the social geography of the African American community had been radically transformed. The center of the black St. Louis had shifted from the city to the northern suburbs. What happened? Why did this occur? Before urban renewal, blacks lived in the worst housing in St. Louis. According to city planners, black neighborhoods were situated in the most obsolete dilapidated and blighted sections of the city. The planners argued that the communities where blacks resided were in such poor conditions that they needed to be torn down and completely rebuilt. The goal, however, was not to rehouse blacks in this area, but instead to demolish it so as to make way for the expansion of downtown St. Louis University and other cultural institutions, along with the building of Bush Stadium, the famous Gateway Arch, and the construction of interstate highway connections, connectors. Therefore, to realize their dream of remaking St. Louis, urban leaders knocked down houses, schools, churches, and dis businesses displacing thousands of African Americans in the process. Between 1950 and 1970, these urban renewal projects combined with the influx of thousands of black new incomers to push the African American population deeper and deeper into the city's north side. Zoning laws, and commercial development blocked the movement of blacks into other parts of the city. So they had no choice but to move northward in order to escape the relentless destruction of the urban bulldozer. Finally, living space in the city ran out, forcing the retreating black community into the North County suburban hinterland. When that happened, frantic white suburban knights tried to stop the growing movement of blacks into their communities. The western suburbs used zoning laws based on lot size, housing type, and cost to literally build a wall that kept out blacks and low-income whites. The northern suburban leaders also tried various city building strategies to destabilize emerging black enclaves and to discourage black suburbanization. But nothing worked. 
and blacks continue to flow into the hinterlands. Now I want to stress that those blacks moving to the suburbs did not view themselves as victims running from the destruction and the devastation wrought by the urban bulldozer. Symbolically, they were simply following the advice of Whitney Young. In 1963, Young told African Americans, you must march from the rat-infested, overcrowded ghettos to decent, wholesome, unrestricted residential areas dispersed throughout our city. He believed that African Americans could improve their life chances and gain access to greater socioeconomic opportunities by leaving their run-down, underdeveloped neighborhoods for more highly developed white neighborhoods in the central city and suburbs. So African Americans fled St. Louis, hoping to find the American dream in the northern suburbs. Ferguson was one of the stops along the Black County Northern Migratory Route, and a number of African Americans chose to settle there. African Americans from across the class and income divide moved to Ferguson, hoping to improve their lives by finding enhanced life chances and greater socioeconomic opportunities. Ferguson Whites, however, had a very different idea about the types of communities that provided people with such chances and opportunities. They did not believe that living in a suburb with African Americans would make their lives better. So they left. As blacks moved into Ferguson, whites moved out. In 1970, when Ferguson's population peaked to 29,000, less than 1% of the suburb was black. The racial profile, however, changed over time. In 1980, it was 86% white and 14% black. In 1990, 74% white and 25% black. In 2000, 45% white and 52% black. By 2010, it was 29% white and 67% black. Ferguson, once a white suburb, was now a mostly black community. In the span of 40 years, the white population had plunged by 20, from 28,000 to 6,000, a difference of 134%. This outmigration of whites from Ferguson was part of a larger exodus of whites from the northern suburbs throughout the region. Whites moved out as blacks moved in. For a moment, some blacks thought they were pioneer urbanites integrating the northern suburbs. But the movement of blacks in and whites out was more like two ships passing in the night. Between 1990 and 2010, for example, Blacks and whites in Metro St. Louis were moving in opposite directions. As blacks migrated to the northern suburbs, whites migrated to the southern and western parts of the metropolis. The outmigration of whites was not benign. It weakened the suburbs' housing market, undermined its tax base, and triggered a set of structural forces that spawned a downward spiral in the community's development. In Ferguson and elsewhere in the United States, market dynamics drive the neighborhood and community development process. 
This makes understanding the socioeconomic profile of Black Ferguson extremely important. Black Ferguson is a mixed income community consisting of people from across the class and income divide. It is not a prototypical ghetto filled with poor people who have been abandoned by the middle class. The medium household income is 31,000, with a little over half the population having incomes below 35,000, including 20% who live in poverty. Concurrently, a third of the population has middle class incomes, with a small percent having incomes greater than 75,000 annually. The mixed income character of Ferguson is reflected in the relationship between homeowners and renters. Black neighborhoods differ from white neighborhoods in terms of the proportion of renters to owners. Homeowners typically dominate white communities, while black neighborhoods are usually dominated by the renter class. In this setting, the housing units of owners and renters are intermingled with the two groups often living together on the same block. Now this is extremely important because the physical appearance and the physical condition of these rental properties, along with the overall physical condition of the neighborhood, will determine the value and price of owner-occupied housing units. This is significant because in the United States, home ownership is a status symbol and a method of wealth production. When a person buys a house, they expect the value of the house to increase over time. So when it is eventually sold, they will make a profit. Hypothetically speaking then, if a person buys a house for $100,000, he or she expects the value of that house to increase over time. So when it is sold, the house might be worth, say, 200000 thereby enabling the owner to make a substantial profit off the sale. Moreover, the house also provides the owner with home equity, which refers to the difference between the value of the house and the amount of money still owed. Homeowners are able to use the equity in their homes to borrow money if needed or desired. For the homeowner to protect his or her property, they must be able to continually improve and upgrade the quality of their homes while simultaneously working with their neighbors to keep the overall quality up for the entire community. However, because of their limited access to financial markets and because of the large number of renters living in their neighborhoods, black homeowners are particularly vulnerable to the volatility of the housing market. Thus, in black neighborhoods, even though owners have higher incomes than renters, because they share residential space, their destinies are interlocked. Starting in 2008, a subprime mortgage and foreclosure crisis had a devastating impact on Ferguson. To understand how this crisis impacted black Ferguson and created the conditions that led to that deadly encounter between Michael Brown and uh, Darren Wilson, it is necessary to discuss how the crisis affected homeowners and renters. Let's first take a look to see what happened to black homeowners. Subprime mortgages are given to borrowers who cannot obtain a conventional mortgage because they are considered credit risks. Consequently, these mortgages carry with them a higher interest rate 
with monthly payments that are more unpredictable than conventional loans. In the 1990s, with the backing of the federal government, the subprime mortgage industry boomed, and it targeted blacks and other low-income groups. African Americans, however, regardless of their income or credit rating, were typically forced to take these subprime mortgages. And these loans exposed them to the harmful effects of the volatile housing market. Now, the homeownership class anchors Black Ferguson. About 46% of the households fall into this category and they have a medium household income of around 49,000. Comparatively speaking, Ferguson has a high home ownership rate, which is above the metropolitan and national black home ownership rates. Many of these black homeowners use subprime mortgages to purchase their house. Then disaster hit. The subprime mortgage and foreclosure prices smashed Black Ferguson with the force of a sledgehammer. It triggered a catastrophic drop in housing prices, which in turn spawned an underwater mortgage crisis. A mortgage is underwater when the owner owes more than the house is worth. A drop in housing prices causes this type of predicament. Let me give you an example. Say a, a, a person originally bought a house for $300,000, but the value of the house did not increase. It decreased. So today, the house is only worth $100,000. The problem is the bank, the owner still owes the bank $200,000. So even if the house is sold, they will still be in debt. By 2013, 59% of the mortgages held by Ferguson Blacks were underwater. The subprime and foreclosure crisis put them in a financial situation where they had no good choices. They could not sell the house unless the banks were willing to take a loss. If they defaulted on the loan by not paying it, the bank would foreclose, causing them to lose both their house and credit rating. These owners were not only stuck in place, but they also lost their home equity. So in this situation, because they're in a financial limbo, many of them will be tempted to stop making improvements and upgrades on their homes because of their limited financial resources. If that happens, it would only intensify neighborhood decline, causing the value of their homes to drop even more. Ferguson blacks were not the only ones hard hit by the underwater mortgage crisis. The North County suburbs, all in this area, were all underwater. And they had the highest underwater mortgage rate in all of metropolitan St. Louis. In Berkeley, for example, 66% of the underwater mortgages were held by blacks. In Forestan, 58%. In Spanish Lake, 57%. So because the underwater mortgage affected the entire North County, it greatly weakened the housing market across that region, depressing the value and the price of housing and reducing sales. Now, if you look at the total map, 
the crisis is literally concentrated in those parts of the metropolis where the African American population is situated and located. In other parts of the county, you do not get anywhere near those magnitudes and levels of concentration. So in the North County, for blacks, home ownership became a tool of debt creation, not wealth production. Consequently, blacks found themselves trapped in a housing market that robbed them of their financial security, reduced their purchasing power, and pushed them toward economic marginalization. The subprime crisis also impacted the low-income uh, rental market. And in so doing it, it placed black homers at even greater risk by threatening the, uh, by increasing the threat of neighborhood decay, housing abandonment, and declining property values. The culprit is the flipping of foreclosed houses to rentals by private investment groups. Across the nation, a growing number of hedge funds private equity groups and other investors are profiting off the subprime crisis by buying foreclosed homes from banks and turning them into rental properties. The largest investors are focusing on the high end of the market, and this has opened the door for smaller investors, such as Raineth Home, headquartered in LA, to carve out a niche in the low-income market. The invasion of Ferguson by institutional investors is particularly troubling. In neighborhoods with large numbers of low-income renters, the physical appearance of rental property shapes the visual image of the community, affects property values, and determines the strength of the neighborhood housing market. The economic calculus of low-income rental market will determine if the property owner maintains and upkeeps his or her property. The reason is that investors, to generate a profit, must have tenants capable of paying rents that exceed the cost of maintenance, operations, upgrades, and property taxes. If this does not happen, the property owner will cut back on expenses until they hit the bottom line where profits can be made. In Ferguson, the likelihood of investors making a profit and keeping up their rental property is not good. The medium household income of black renters is only 21000 and about 90% of the rental units in which they live are 50 years or more older. When low-income housing meets low income, when low incomes meet old housing, the results are always toxic. The reason is that such dwellings require substantial maintenance and upkeep and the cost of repairs can be substantial. The big danger in Ferguson is that property owners will allow their housing units to deteriorate if the rental calculus does not work. If that happens, neighborhood conditions will worsen, housing prices will continue to fall, and property values will drop. Now this risk does not concern predatory investors like Rainer. They're not community builders. They're profiteers aiming to make money by turning foreclosed homes into rental units. Since 2011, Rainer has acquired 72 single family homes in Ferguson and turned most of them into low rental units for single mothers eligible for Section 8 housing vouchers. While it is too soon to grade Raineth and other corporate investors in Ferguson, the early returns are not promising. 
Some ranters, renters have already started to make complaints, and although their grievances are minor, I expect the grumbling to grow louder and louder with the passage of time. The reason is the private housing market has never provided low-income renters with high-quality affordable housing. According to the National Low-Income Housing Coalition, there is not a single city in the United States where a full-time minimum wage worker can obtain an affordable one or two bedroom apartment at a fair market price. There is no reason to believe that Raineth will succeed where others have failed. This rental calculus is unyielding on the profitability question. If cost exceeds profits, the property owner will cut back until profits exceed costs. It is as simple as that. Hence, in Ferguson, the expected outcome is that the private investors will fail in their quest to provide quality, low-income blacks with quality, affordable rentals. And eventually, with the passage of time, these units will deteriorate, spreading neighborhood decay and declines in property value. Housing abandonment is another danger created by white out migration and the subprime mortgage and foreclosure crisis. Ferguson is a shrinking suburb that not only lost 28% of its population between 1970 and 2010, but the socioeconomic profile of the community also changed. The population is now smaller and poorer than its predecessor. This combined with the foreclosure and the depressed housing market may cause housing abandonment to become a serious problem. In 2013, there were about 934 vacant housing units in Greater Ferguson that were not for sale or rent. The addition of a large inventory of vacant and abandoned units to a growing inventory of rental properties will blight the suburb depressed the market, farther erode the tax base, and make neighborhood development even more challenging. So the issue really exemplifies Ferguson's dilemma. In the short term, corporate investors are reducing the potential number of abandoned properties, while in the long term, they are sowing the seeds of neighborhood deterioration and property value and declines in property value. This is what we call a classic catch-22. Lastly, white out migration and the subprime mortgage and foreclosure crisis is eroding Ferguson's tax base. The suburb is dependent on sales and property taxes for revenue. However, whiteout migration created a smaller and poorer population with greater socioeconomic needs. Thus, at the very moment that Ferguson needs additional resources to deal with the increased needs of its population, the subprime mortgage and foreclosure crisis is reducing property values and curtailing consumer spending. The ongoing loss of revenue will lead to spending cuts and a reduction in services which will continually erode the quality of life, increase social tensions, and lead to the escalation of crime and violence. This is a structural problem caused by metropolitan inequality. Metro St. Louis is fragmented into 91 different municipalities, including 28 townships. Ferguson and other northern suburbs, however, are literally walled off from the more prosperous western suburbs. A comparison of the uh, per capita income 
of Ladue with the other suburbs. Uh, uh, Ladue is located in the west, and uh, Ferguson and other north suburbs will illustrate my point. The per capita income in Ladue is $90,000 annually. In Ferguson, it is 18,000. Blackjack, 23,000. Berkeley, 14,000. And Kinloch, 9,000. Ladue is 94% white. Ferguson, Blackjack, Berkeley, and Kinloch are more than 60% black. The problem of metropolitan inequality is a problem of the uneven distribution in metropolitan resources. The people produce the wealth found in Metro St. Louis, and that wealth should be used in the equitable development of the entire region, but it is not. The St. Louis governance structure makes it possible to create municipalities that have the capacity to capture a greater share of the regional resources than the other uh, municipalities. The problem is that income is the cost of admissions into these richer, more powerful, and highly developed municipalities. The inequitable governance systems ensures that people who live in the highly developed suburbs and central city neighborhoods will have superior services, greater opportunities, enhanced life chances, and more desirable outcomes than those people living in the less developed suburbs and other central city neighborhoods. This reality explains why Ferguson and other northern suburbs with limited resources use aggressive policing and judicial practices to secure the resources needed to balance their budgets. In 2013, for example, over one quarter of Ferguson's budgets came from traffic fines and court fees. That year, a municipality servicing a suburb of 21,000 pe people issued 32,975 arrest warrants for nonviolent offenses. Indeed, it was this endless search to secure resources to fund municipal services that placed Michael Brown and Darren Wilson on the road that led to that deadly encounter. The larger point is that metropolitan inequality is institutionalized and legitimized by a governance structure that produces rich and poor suburbs and central city neighborhoods. In closing, Ferguson is not an anomaly. Black neighborhoods are durable and crucial sites where racial and social class inequality are transmitted, generated, and reproduced from one generation to the other. Thus, the movement of African Americans to the St. Louis suburbs did not lead though, to their settlement in communities with superior services greater opportunities and enhanced life chances and more desirable life outcomes. Rather, when they moved to Ferguson's, whites fled and the suburb began to mimic the declining central city neighborhoods that they left behind. Throughout this presentation, I've identified four structural elements that triggered Ferguson's downward spiral. I call these the four horsemen of structural racism. White privilegeism, the metropolitan city building process, neoliberal housing market dynamics and metropolitan inequality, 
These four horsemen are interactive and interdependent, and they are components of a larger and more complex system of structural racism and social class inequality, which includes the marginalization of blacks within the occupational structure. Before ending, I want to say a few words about the horsemen. The first is white privilegeism. If black communities are durable and crucial sites for the transmission and reproduction of racial and social class inequality, then develop white communities are durable and crucial sites where white privilege, racism, and social class superiority is generated, transmitted, and reproduced from one generation to another. When blacks moved to the northern suburbs, whites could have stayed and worked with them to build authentically integrated neighborhoods. Some did, most did not. The reason is they wanted to sustain their privileges and privileged position in society. So they departed the integrating northern suburbs to resegregate themselves in the western suburbs in the elite central city neighborhoods. The metropolitan city building process is the second horseman of structural racism. City leaders intentionally built a metropolis that was segregated on the basis of race and class. They accomplished this task by using city plans, zoning laws, subdivision regulation, and building codes designed to construct neighborhoods that were segregated by income, housing type, and housing costs. In this way, given the location of blacks at the bottom of the economic order, they were able to build suburbs and, and central city neighborhoods that kept out both blacks and low-income whites. I've already talked at length about the third and fourth horsemen, the dynamics of the housing market and metropolitan inequality. So there is no need for me to elaborate. Finally, the Ferguson story is about the extension of the chronic urban crisis into the suburban hinterland and the reconstruction of urban space. We're no longer living in an urban metropolis con characterized by the concentration of blacks and poor people in the central city and affluent whites in the suburb. The metro is now a more complex spatial phenomenon. Blacks, people of color, and low-income whites are now scattered across the metropolis while increasingly upwardly mobile whites are moving back to the central city. This heightened residential mobility, however, does not carry with it the movement toward greater opportunities, enhanced life chances, and more desirable life outcomes. Today, for blacks, people of color, and low-income whites, including the low white middle classes, the world is becoming an increasingly precarious place, and downward social mobility is becoming the new normal. So this heightened residential mobility is nothing more than a form of motion without movement. What is happening in Ferguson, as I previously mentioned, is happening across the country. Of course, the narratives of very com various communities will differ. And so too with the plots and subplots, but everywhere the ending will be the same, and everywhere structural forces will be the engine driving race and social class inequality. Therefore, to change the realities we face so as to build a better America, it will be necessary to dismantle these structural mechanisms. To achieve this goal will require the development of new strategies and tactics, along with the building of new types of institutions and the creation of bold partnerships that cut across the race and class divide. 
struggles ahead will be among the most difficult and complex in American history. So I urge you to dream the impossible dream and to cast away your illusions and join with us to create this better America. And if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? Thank you. We got a few moments for some questions. That's a, a, a huge issue. I, I think, in, in my view, the, the, the first place that we start in, 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 in the battle is to begin to rebuild the neighborhoods and communities where we live. Uh, and I say rebuild the neighborhoods and, and communities where we live because the huge culprit, in my opinion, is, is not so much that, that we have the kind of massive income distribution that, that exists everywhere, but that this income distribution is translated into huge differences in the quality of life huge differences in the type of housing that you live in, huge differences in the types of education that you receive, huge differences in the kind of recreational facilities and other services that you have in your neighborhood, huge differences in the quality of, of your health care. So if we can fight to make the neighborhoods better, we begin to force the state to rethink its allocation of resources. And that begins the first step toward income transformation. And I'm, I'm saying this because it is a myth that you can move to freedom in America. That's what Ferguson is about. That's just not true. And so if we improve all of those places, that's when life changes. And a part of that battle is to change the governance system. Because one of the things that happens, if all of us create wealth in this region, that wealth should be equitably shared and distributed. And one of the tricks that elites use is they create their own little neighborhoods and communities, municipalities. Then they are able to capture the taxes in those municipalities. They're able to capture their own property taxes. They're able to recreate a world based upon the disproportional uh, capture of, of these types of resources. So we fight to build the neighborhoods and simultaneously we fight around the ways in which resources across the region are distributed. Other questions? Yes. Sure, that's a great question. Let's take education. We should not have some communities with great schools and other communities with poor schools. 
And if you look at the communities with, with great schools, those communities have access to a wide range of resources that other people don't have. And I'm not just saying the resources that occur in terms of the school budget. I'm talking about the resources that allow someone to take their child to Spain for the summer. Someone that allows them to take their child to Washington, D.C. over spring break, providing them with a vast range of experiences that kids that don't have the resources to do that can do. Uh, so with, with the, that's what I'm saying with, in terms of the quality of education. Take health care, for example. Uh, in the United States, we spend over $3 billion a year on research that relates to health care, over a trillion dollars on the delivery of health care services itself. Yet, there's a tremendous disparity in the quality of health care that African Americans, Latino, and poor people receive. A part of that is that we've not created a delivery system that deals with the realities that they face. We should build that type of delivery system. That is a resource issue in question. Um, let us take the infrastructure in a neighborhood and a community. I don't know a lot about uh, Albany but, and, and Troy, but I do know in neighborhoods that I work in in, in Buffalo that uh, uh, streets are dilapidated. We allow houses, rental properties to be run down and not force the, the people to upgrade them. The services are poor in terms of trash pickup and don't even talk about snow removal. That's a resource issue because someone has to pay for that. And so city leaders look around and say, well, I'm gonna put it over here because I only got a little bit of money. Am I gonna put it here? Or I'm gonna put it there. And they choose to put it elsewhere. This is a rich region. The United States is, is the wealthiest country on the planet. So there are certain kinds of things that just simply should not exist. And they exist because money that is over here is not shared with everyone. We've not developed the kinds of, of systems to ensure that that quality of life is raised. And at the end of the day, it's about life and death. Because in the numbers, I work also on, on health-based issues. And, 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 the, and, and blacks and Latinos die almost five times prematurely than whites. Their life expectancies are lower. And so it's all of these issues that, that are connected not only with you know, the, the, the waste of, of human resources. And so it's reallocating funds. Like right now, the United States is the leading jailer in the world. We put more of our own people in prison than any other country on the planet. Name the worst place you know, and we still put more people. Why not take the resources that are being invested in putting people into prison and reallocate those resources so that you're building neighborhoods, communities, and providing opportunities for people so they don't ever go to prison. We spend more money jailing people than we do educating people. So that's what I mean by resources. You've got a certain amount of money. How are you going to spend it? Are you going to spend it this way or that way, or are you going to spend it another way? That's all about resources. Yes. I would place it a little different. I, I get where, where you're coming from about not thinking ourselves of a, of a we. It starts with a more basic question, I think. And that question is, 
What kind of society do we want to build? What kind of a country do we want to have? And, and it starts with people really being educated. I hear people say, the United States is the greatest country on earth. I said, it is. What's that based on? Give me your indicators that say we're the greatest country in the world. And the only indicator you can come up with is the amount of money that we have and our military power. We're not anywhere near number one in terms of health care. We're not even number one in terms of life expectancy. You know, and then you, when you start looking at all of the quality of life indexes, you'll find this country is down the line on a number of these different things, except wealth and power. We have to decide the type of nation that we want. I mean, you can have whatever view you want to about Cuba. I've spent a lot of time there over the last 15 years. And the one thing I've come to appreciate about the, the, the Cuban project is that they've demonstrated that a small country with limited resources can develop a world-class health system. Why should someone in a little bitty country like Cuba have better access to health care than a poor or black or a brown person in, in the United States? And, and I'm saying it's a question of what kind of society do you want to want to build? And uh, if we follow that pattern, the we will take care of, of itself. I mean, it's not a we or a not a we that allows us to create a fragmented metropolis where you have rich and poor municipalities. It's not a we or an us that allows us to create a tiered educational system. I mean, we can fool ourselves to think that the public schools are going to compete with these privates, that, that, that kids coming out of our state college are going to compete with the kids coming out of Princeton, Yale, and Harvard. Why, 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 why should we have this kind of tiered system where money creates a different avenue. I, I sent my son to a private school and I, it cost $15,000 a year. From the time he was in first grade till the time he graduated from high school, $15,000 a year. How many people can pay $15,000 a year just to go to school? And the kids coming out of that, those schools and when, I, when I, was, I was a commencement speaker at Nichols High School where my son went, and this was before he went there, and I spent a week there just talking to people. Classes, a big class was 12 people in the class. And I asked a student one, I said, what do you like the most about this school? And he said that I can ask questions and no one will think I'm stupid and I can get all the help I need. So I'm saying we, we create all of these hierarchies because that's what we want. Like, we have slums and ghettos and bad places because that's what we want. We designed it that way. We created it. And uh, if you remember the slide, uh, let me pull it up. And these are the zoning laws. 
They, they were creating a place. These are areas for single family houses only. The blacks were living over in these areas, a multiple area locations and places. You couldn't get into these neighborhoods. Out here, they created the, the zoning laws that would allow creating big houses and other types of things, lots. You couldn't get that there. They went all out of their way creating these spaces to block movement this way. So what I'm saying, we created a society that was specifically designed to produce outcomes. It, it, and, and, and I have focused on, on, on structures because we get too caught up in, in just attitude. Those whites who moved out of Ferguson, it was about white privilege. It wasn't about racism. They wanted an edge. Y'all have heard about Tom Brady and Deflate Gate. How many have heard about that? He wanted an edge. That's what you get when you compete. You want an edge. If I got the football I like and you don't have the football you like, I got an edge. And in a real tight game, an edge can mean the difference between winning and losing. How many have heard of Lance Armstrong? Let me see your hand. He took those, he redid his blood and all that, so he would have an edge. It didn't matter whether it was this little much of an edge. He wanted an advantage. The advantage would ensure that he would win, or he would have a better chance to win. The Patriots cheat because they want an edge. Whites wanted an edge. They didn't want to live in those neighborhoods with blacks, making sure that they got everything that they got. This is dog eat dog. People go for the edge. So they left and move back to places that would give them the edge. They didn't want my children to have the same shot at the job as their children. Five jobs, 30 people, give me the GF edge. Give me the edge. They didn't want to risk the value of their houses not being as great. I want the edge. They create the hierarchy so that some people have the edge and others don't. So we have to understand the structure that produces the attitude and the outcome. Then we change the structure. We begin to change the outcome and the thing. It's, it's like this. Back at this moment of time, all over America, blacks and whites live together. Racial residential segregation is new in America. We didn't live this way. But they decided that the owner-occupied house, the single-family house, the single family house would become a commodity. They decided that neighborhoods would become a commodity where you could make money buying and selling. The minute that decision was made, you couldn't have everybody all living all up together. To maximize profits, you had to build a different type of city. Now, to understand what I'm talking about, there's this magnificent website by David Gordon called Mapping Decline in St. Louis. If you get on that website, 
you can go from 1940 all the way to 2010 and watch the movement of blacks and whites into space. And then you can see how, as they begin to create a certain type of city, the population begin to segregate and separate themselves out. If we change the structures, we can change the outcome and the attitude. If we leave in place the structures of racism and social class inequality, we're not changing outcome. We're only creating illusion. One last question, if there are any. Yes. Uh, in, in, in different places, uh, we have pockets of things that are happening and, and going on. Um, and I think that um, and in some places, uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont comes to mind. Portland, Oregon is a city that has done some interesting, you know, uh, kinds of, of things. Uh, but right now, American cities are in a, in a really big flux. And we're struggling because whenever things shift and change, they, they create opportunity. And so right now, I mean, the, the kind of dramatic movement around in space that you see in, in, in St. Louis, and even across the country in the top 100 uh, metropolitan areas, uh, over f half the black population now lives in the suburban areas. And those suburban areas are following pretty much the same pattern. But the movement around is literally creating an opportunity for us to build new types of cities. And so there's not a single model or place, and in a lot of ways it couldn't. But if we look across the world, not just get caught up into looking here, then there are places where we could emulate. I mean, the Scandinavian countries are doing some very interesting things in the sense of the way in which they are able to capture wealth and put it back. Um, I'm fascinated by the type of social geography that exists in Havana, Cuba. And by that I mean to say they've integrated their tourist sites in neighborhoods and communities where ordinary people live. And they've allowed public spaces to be public spaces that are enjoyed by everyone. I mean, if you come to, to a lot of I'll use Buffalo, for example. If you go to Buffalo's waterfront, which is absolutely marvelous and beautiful, you won't find many black or Latino people on that waterfront. And that's because somehow it's been designed in a particular way. Or if you go to D.C. now, you go down near the uh, Capitol and all those other places, they've erased poor people, erased a lot of black and Latin people, and you just see the tourists roaming around there. They haven't done that there. So I think creating those kinds of, of spaces and places is great. I think uh, the Scandinavia is particularly interesting considering how they have created this mass public transit system and ride lots of bicycles, even though it, you know, it's cold. They have these hyper long winters. I was in Oslo a couple of years ago, and it was 11.30 at night, and looked like it is outside. You know, my poor pathetic body didn't know what to do. Do I sleep? Do I stay awake? Uh, so there are some, if we look across the world at different locations and places and look at other people who are experimenting with different types of things, then we can find, you know, ideas about how we can create uh, this better America how we can create an America where being poor does not mean living in a raggedy, 
run-down house with limited opportunities, a place where you can't tell where the race of people are simply based on, on the zip code, a place where you create public spaces where it's okay for somebody to be out there drunk as long as they're not bothering anybody, as long as they're minding their own business, a place that is safe and a place that has this we connected to it. Thank you. I've enjoyed my stay here.